Okay, everyone, good morning and good afternoon. Hello, wherever you're coming from. Uh, it's nice to see everyone here at this fine seminar. Um, my name is Lauren Hayes. I'm at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, and I'm one of your hosts for the fine seminar today. Um, just a couple of uh, quick announcements before I introduce the speaker. Uh, first off, um, I wanna announce next week's speaker. So I'm gonna share my screen really quick. We're excited that next week we have Andy C who will be joining us from UC Davis. Andy will be talking about individual differences in behavior and social dynamics that influence ecologically important outcomes. Uh, so that will be our, our speaker for next week. And the week after we're excited that we're going to be hosting a panel discussion on long-term studies. Uh, this will be include um, five guests. We'll have Tim Clutton Brock, Dan Blumstein, Kay Holacamp, uh, Christina Real, and Dan, uh, D Dustin Rubenstein will be uh, participating in a discussion based on their experiences with long term studies. And the aim is to really target um, students who are interested or postdocs who are interested in starting a long term study. So please encourage your students to attend this. Um, we have well over 100 years of long-term study on this panel, and um, you know there are many of us in the audience and hosts that have conducted long-term studies as well. So it's a really great opportunity for students to learn um, how to approach those. And the structure of the, the presentation or the panel will be based on questions that were generated by some of our students. Um, here's just the, the four students that um, sent questions to us um, and we are going to be relaying those to the panelists and get their feedback on those specific questions. So it should be a really fascinating and exciting um, uh, uh, discussion. So we hope that you and your students can attend in two weeks. So this brings me to our speaker today. Uh, um, today we are very happy to have with us Professor Annalise Beery. Um, uh, Annalise is now at UC Berkeley. Uh, she did her bachelor's degree at Williams College in uh, Massachusetts, her PhD work, PhD work at Berkeley, and postdoc at uh, uh, in San Francisco and also at Berkeley, after which she spent some time as a professor at Smith College in Massachusetts, and I believe this year uh, took a new position at UC Berkeley. Um, Annalise is uh, going to be, her talk today is going to be more integrative. She, she, her research focuses on neurobiological pathways that underline or support behavior, uh, social behaviors. Um, she's also interested in how stress and social behavior relate to each other and how early life exposure shape the development of behavior. Um, she's also done interesting work on sex bias and research subjects. And remarkably, you know, she studies mammals, but she studies a, a wide range of rodents. Um, I found work on voles of various species, tuco tucos, Alaskan tig uh, voles, with another, another vole, um, belding brown squirrels and hamsters, and of course, you know, my favorite, the degu. And so Annalise has a wide understanding, a broad understanding of, um, of uh, rodent social behavior in particular. Um, I can speak personally about some collaboration with Annalise. We wrote a book chapter together several years ago now, um, and that was really a pleasure. Um, brought a really interesting neurobiological component to her work on the Degus. Um, she's been really successful in securing funding for this work from NSF and NIH, and she's generated um, over 40 publications and really good journals, um, journals including Hormones and Behavior, Tree, Nature, Biology Letters, et cetera. Um, really productive. And one of her papers was written, it was a review article that she wrote as part of her award from the Society of Behavioral Neuroendocrinology. She was awarded the Frank Beach Award, a prestigious award that's uh, once per year, um, and wrote a nice review article in Hormones and Behavior based on that. Um, so today, Annalise is going to be talking to us about her work. Uh, she, the title of her seminar is Selectivity and Sociality, What the Nature of a Group Indicates About the Mechanisms that Maintain It. At this point, I'll turn it over to Annalise, and thanks for being here. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Lauren, for that introduction. And thanks so much for having me in this amazing seminar series. It's really an honor to be speaking here to all of you. And I'm really excited to talk about some of the neurobiology of social behavior. So uh, my background and training is initially in neuroscience. I've also done some field biology, a lot of molecular biology. And, uh, and I sort of think of myself as existing at the interface of several different departments, possibly because I was appointed in psychology, neuroscience, biology, organismal and evolutionary biology over at UMass in the grad program and neuroscience and behavior and now integrative biology. So integrative biology sounds like a good umbrella for all of this work. Um, but I enjoy sort of wearing these different disciplinary hats and trying to learn what I can from different perspectives uh, to shape what I think about in terms of the neurobiology of social behavior. All right, so I had to start with a slide with lots of interesting examples of social behavior because of course, we often talk about the neurobiology of social behavior as if it were a unified construct. I think neurobiologists do this particularly often. Uh, but of course, there's tremendous diversity in social behavior and social groups. So we have species that form pair bonds, some that live in extremely large groups, others that exhibit cooperative breeding. Uh, groups can be made up of mostly related or unrelated individuals. You might see here the third image there. I stole the Yuhinas from Sheng Fen Shen's talk earlier this semester. Um, we can have transient groups, we can have stable groups, and that's going to make life really complicated as we start to ask the broad and simplistic question, uh, why is it that some animals are highly social? So we're just going to keep in mind that we may end up with multiple answers to this question, and that's one of the reasons that we need to study diverse species in order to understand how general the answers that we get can be. So across species, of course, there's enormous variation in social behavior, all the way from species like this pygmy shrew on one side that may only come together to mate or fight, and the females engage in very little parental care, all the way to these gelada baboons or these bats that live in large social groups and exhibit a number of different interesting social behaviors. So if I'm interested, which I am, in the origin of variation in social behavior, uh, group living provides a really nice marker for the sorts of social behaviors that I'm interested in and provides a jumping off point to ask the comparative question, what causes some species or individuals to be more social than others? So of course, anytime we ask a why question about behavior, there are different ways to try and answer it. And there are a number of great talks, even in this series, looking at why be social from a sort of an ultimate perspective. How does social behavior of various kinds uh, contribute to survival and reproduction? And over on the other side of things, I kind of come in more from the physiological angle and ask from the perspective of the individual that's being social, what is it in the brain that actually motivates that individual to be with other individuals? Or in the case that you have affiliation in the absence of motivation, how do they put up with each other? So these are people on a subway train. I don't know that any of them really wanted to be next to each other, uh, but they're putting up with each other in a, in a high density group. And then an, another important feature that we've come to look at is how selective are these relationships? What is the nature of um, the membership of the groups? All right, so fortunately, when I was starting out on this almost 18 years ago, I think now, uh, there was a good basis for understanding some other types of social behavior. Particularly, there was research in the realm of parental behavior and especially maternal behavior across a wide range of mammals and other taxonomic groups. And then there was also a lot of work on the neurobiological basis of pair bonding and social monogamy. And here, these are prairie voles that you can see. So I like to label both of these sort of reproductive relationships. And I know that many relationships, even if they're not directly reproductive, might be indirectly reproductive. But these ones are pretty directly reproductive relationships. Um, but not all of our social relationships are with offspring and mates. And so I really was interested in taking on this question of what leads to the kind of cohesion that gives you social groups. And I call these, this is very clunky, but I call these peer relationships, right? We can't call it the biology of friendship in an animal. Uh, we need some other term of it, but these are peer relationships. They may or may not be same sex, but they're not directly about reproduction. So to start off, and I don't study prairie dogs, I just thought these were a great, uh, a great example of a group. Um, the start in question is really, is this fundamentally similar to other forms of affiliative behavior? And then in order to ask that, I had to ask another question, which is, what is the species that I'm going to use to look at this or multiple species, as it turns out? 
All right, so here are the criteria that I started with. I wanted to study this in a small mammal. That was a constraint uh, introduced by the, the program that I was in, the expertise that I had available to me. Um, I wanted to study this in a species that was not monogamous, so that I could look at group living outside of the context of monogamy. That's easy. It's a small fraction of small mammals that are monogamous. And then I wanted a species that lived in groups. That's not as easy to find, but it's not that hard either. And then the hardest constraint was that I wanted a non-social version to compare whatever study I, species I was studying to, whether it was another species or another phenotype within the species. So I sat down, actually, I sat down with Eileen Lacey and Irv Zucker and uh, went through the mammal books with Eileen and, uh, and thought about some different interesting candidates. Dan, I see here in the audience here. We thought about marmots. They have beautiful variation in their social behavior across species, but they, they violated a size constraint. I couldn't really see bringing marmots into the lab to do the sort of work that I wanted to do. Um, pikas, there are, you know, of course, the pikas in Colorado are interesting and solitary and territorial, but have interesting vocalizations. There's a social species in Mongolia would have been great great possibility, uh, violated a logistics constraint, which is that I ever wanted to, <laughs> to be able to conduct this work and, and get out of graduate school. So um, with that, I turned to the first of several different models that I've ended up working with over time. And the primary model is uh, the meadow vole. So in meadow voles, we study seasonal variation in sociality. And then we've also started more recently to compare meadow voles and prairie voles to look at the difference between mate and peer relationships across these two species. Um, also started some work, and if I have time at the end, I have three slides uh, dedicated to this project where we've been looking at uh, group living and solitary species across uh, tuco tucos, carreros, and degus, these South American rodents, um, where most of the species are solitary, some of them are social, trying to look for neurobiological markers that go along with being social. So is there, for example, an oxytocin receptor distribution in the brain that goes along with living in groups, or are there patterns more constrained by phylogeny? Um, with Melissa Holmes, I had the opportunity to collaborate on a few studies in naked mole rats, looking at the role of social hierarchy on some of these brain features. And then just in the last couple of years, we've been doing a study in Belding's ground squirrels looking at dispersal because, um, of course, all social mammals, um, all mammals start out life in a group, however briefly, and some of them then undergo a transition where they go from being social and living in this group to dispersing. And so that's sort of another transition in social behavior that we can study, although social behavior is not the only thing that changes during dispersal. All right, so in this talk, I'm really gonna focus in on the voles. And so I wanna just start by giving you some background on particularly meadow voles. So uh, if you've heard of voles in a neurobiological context, I can nearly guarantee that the species that you hear about the most is the prairie vole. And that's because they've been um, sort of the predominant monogamous rodent studied in lab studies for the last several decades. So they form pair bonds, um, both males and females engage in parental care. Um, they form selective relationships, both with their mates and with familiar same-sex peers. Okay. Meadow voles, on the other hand, are not monogamous. In the field, they have uniparental families and they exhibit seasonal group living. And so that's what I really wanna sort of show you next. So if we look in summer months, this is actually one of my field sites in Western Massachusetts at an apple orchard. Um, they have uh, burrows near the bases of the apple trees all along the blueberry bushes, all the places the farmers don't want them. But the females in this uh, species are solitary and territorial, in fact, more territorial than the males. Um, and they each stake out their own individual territories. They live in underground burrow systems. They form these runways in the grass. So here you can see a cutaway of one of those burrow systems and you can see at the entrance to a runway how they sort of have these stereotyped places that they go and, and wear the grass down. Now that's where the grass has recently been mowed. Most of the time their runways look like this. They form these sort of tunnels through the grass. And my kids are excellent at spotting these tunnels. <laughs> um, perhaps that's what comes from uh, growing up in a family with rodent nerds. 
All right, so the adult females are solitary and territorial, the males range over territories. And this is really nicely encapsulated in some field data from Dale Madison back in 1980, looking at the radio telemetry ranges. Each, each of these polygons sort of represents the home range of one female. So I can put one vol on each of these home ranges. And if you look at this over time, in the summertime, these home ranges are very stable. So if you look in July, you come back in August, each of the same females is still occupying the same territory territory and their exclusive territories. Um, if we come back in the winter, the picture changes. So metavoles in winter remain active throughout the winter. They don't hibernate. And instead they're active underneath, including the snow layer in that subnivian zone. And here you can see sort of the characteristic runways, what they look like as the snow starts to melt. And then as the snow melts further, you can see their tracks. That's actually my backyard. I think I'm one of the few people who actually gets really excited when I find metavole tracks in my backyard. Most people don't like them. But this is a time when uh, metavoles come together and they live in groups of up to about eight individuals. They sleep in smaller nesting clusters. And this seasonal change in behavior is probably driven by temperature, right? They get a benefit from huddling in groups, um, but they have to really change up their act neurobiologically to go from a solitary territorial species to one that lives in social groups. And that's sort of the focus of our study. So coming back to this radio telemetry data, if we take a look now at winter, you see that the home ranges are highly overlapping. These voles are living in groups and that's been shown um, in, in really lovely field data. Um, and then also we can take this model into the lab. All right. Just to take a pause, a brief moment to talk about day length, um, of course, temperature is probably sort of the physiological driver of the need to huddle in groups, um, but it's a terrible indicator of what season it is. Of course, you can have a hot day in winter, a cold day in summer, uh, but day length is the primary signal that northern latitude or high latitude animals use um, as an indicator of what season is coming. And it's one that they can use well in advance of the actual transition. So you can monitor declining day lengths and increasing day lengths and see uh, what season is coming well in advance. And that allows the opportunity for some fairly major shifts in physiology, everything from suppression of reproduction. Um, some species have changes in coat color, um, changes in behavior, reorganization of brain circuits. So as the days are getting shorter going into winter, animals can pay attention to that piece of information. So that allows us to then use metavoles to, to ask the question, how do changes in the brain support that transition to group living? And that's sort of the major question that we go after with these voles. And then after that, we can start to ask, well, once we figure out those mechanisms, do those mechanisms translate across species? And do they translate across relationship types? How specific and how unique is what we learn in the metavoles? So I like to toss my uh, outline slide right in the middle of my talk. So uh, we've just talked about the behavior of metavoles in the field, and I'll tell you about their laboratory behavior a little more in a moment. Um, and what I'm going to do is walk through three different signaling systems and behavior, um, oxytocin and social selectivity. We'll talk about dopamine in the context of social motivation. And then I'm just going to summarize at the end some of the work that we've done on looking at the HPA axis, stress, and social tolerance. Um, and then if I have time, I have a few slides at the end on looking at other species beyond voles. All right. So when we bring meadow voles into the laboratory, this is sort of what you see when you walk into a meadow vole room. And hopefully you see the same thing that I see, which is these guys love to huddle. We recently started housing voles in threes and you can see that all three of them try to stuff themselves into that same little hiding tube. I think we need to get bigger hiding tubes for them. Um, but of course we need a, quant a way to quantify this behavior, right? Not just look, they're huddling in the cage. And a number of studies have done that now looking at specifically changes in behavior mediated solely by day length. So we can house these voles in short days, which is SD here. Short days are the winter-like days or long days, LD. And with only the change in day length, no change in temperature um, and no change in internal body temperature of the voles either, um, they change in terms of what sense, what, what olfactory cues they prefer to sniff. So this is work done by Michael Firkin. And he showed that um, Meadow voles housed in short days like social sense and meadow voles in long days dislike social sense, but only like the social sense that are reproductive sense. Um, we've shown that there's greater huddling uh, in short days than long days. Um, 
Naomi and Drosik showed that bulls in short days prefer to hang out near larger groups. Um, there's more interaction with unfamiliar strangers. And there's some work, although I think we could improve on this, showing that there's reduced uh, anxiety-like behavior in short days as well. So we have a host of behavioral changes triggered solely by day length. And then these go off along with lots of different physiological changes, which I'm actually not going to go into here because those will be sort of embedded in the context as we go along. Okay. So the first question that we're going to start with is selectivity. And first, I want to just show you what I mean by selectivity in the context of peer relationships. So one of the major ways that we measure social behavior in our voles is using the partner preference test. This test was first developed in Sue Carter's lab for use in prairie vole mate pairs. And here we're using it in a same sex context to study peer relationships in meadow voles. So to run this test, you place a focal vole in the center chamber and on either side of the apparatus, uh, a subject, a stimulus is tethered. And that just means they're on a little leash so that they can wander freely throughout their compartment, but they can't leave their compartment. So on one side, a familiar cage mate is tethered. And on the other side, a stranger, a novel individual is tethered. And this test gets run for three hours. For the first hour, the voles just run around and then they sort of settle into the test and start huddling. And then by the third hour, those partner preferences become significant if they're gonna show them. All right, so here are some sample data from a partner preference test run in, um, in this case, female meadow voles uh, across day lengths. And you can see two things here. One thing you can see is that there's just more overall huddling in the short day, winter-like day length housed females. They huddle a lot more than their long day counterparts. And then the other thing that you can hopefully see is that in both cases, uh, it looks like huddling is selective, that, that huddling is biased towards the partner uh, more than the stranger. So they prefer to huddle with the partner versus the stranger, and they huddle more in short day lengths. So this sort of led us to really go down the path of trying to understand the source of that social selectivity. And we thought, hey, this is really interesting because this behavior is very unusual in lab rodents. So all of the work that's done on the neurobiology of social behavior in rats or mice, that's really a different kind of social behavior because these selective familiarity preferences are really uncommon in lab rodents. And then, then when I had one of those moments where I thought, uh-oh, or, or are they? Because the way that we test social behavior is very different in voles and other species. So in voles, I just showed you that partner preference test. It's a three hour test. Um, we use it in a same sex context. It's also used in an opposite sex context. Um, and during that three hour test, there's free access to the conspecific. The parallel test that's used in um, rodents in more of a sort of a biomedical setting is called the sociability test. It is a five to 10 minute long test. It's also run in a same sex context. The familiar animal might not be very familiar. It might be a cage mate or it might be an animal that uh, the, the focal subject was exposed to previously in the last round of testing and then gets exposed to again. So familiarity may not be very strong and then there's no direct contact. So um, in that picture, what you're seeing there are two inverted wire pencil cups of a very particular brand that works well for this study. Um, but those inverted pencil cups allow animals to sniff each other and to interact with each other, but not to huddle with each other. So it just occurred to me, well, what if we put a mouse in a partner preference test and it did actually exhibit this kind of preference behavior? And what would happen if we did voles, uh, if we ran voles in this sort of parallel testing? Um, so we embarked on a little side venue to start to characterize um, behavior in a consistent way across several different rodent species. So here on the left, this is the synthesis of several of those species. Here on the left, you can see the voles and both in meadow voles and prairie voles. And this is sort of on the left here, a meta-analysis across every different uh, meadow vole or prairie vole study we did uh, with the same methodology in our laboratory. And you can see that they show very marked uh, partner preferences. It doesn't matter if I compare data in one year to data in another year. This is sort of a species typical behavior that you see um, in these rodent species. In contrast, both mice um, and rats, we ran them both, 
uh, didn't show any partner preferences. And in some of the shorter tests, uh, mice and rats are well known for showing novelty preferences. We didn't get significant novelty preferences over the three hour span of the test, but we certainly didn't get familiarity preferences. And then um, I ran into Nathan Insel at a Society for Neuroscience meeting and we started talking and that led to an opportunity to collaborate on a population of Daegu's that he had in the lab. Um, and Daegu's had very interesting behavior. They huddled a ton. They loved huddling with each other, but they exhibited a behavior I hadn't seen yet in any other rodent. They'd go back and forth between the partner and the stranger. The partner was a long-term familiar cage mate. The stranger was a novel individual and they loved huddling with both animals and actually made sure that they huddled with both animals within the context of a single behavioral test. So if you work with rodents, you might be thinking, well, you know, huddling behavior is something the voles do, but it's not something that all rodents really do. You can't necessarily take a species and put them in a partner preference test and expect them to huddle. And we can also look at the chamber times. How much time do they spend just sort of near an animal that they know versus another animal? And here you get basically the same thing. The meadow voles and the prairie voles spend the most time in the chamber of the animal they know. The mice actually spend the most time in the central chamber all alone. Um, the rats are very similar and the daegus spend almost no time in the solitary chamber and almost all of the time in the chamber, either the partner or the stranger, but actually on an individual basis, both. So we can really conclude that these sort of selective social relationships are uncommon in social rodents. And that's something that we have a particular opportunity to study in voles. All right, so as we start to study these selective social relationships. The first candidate that we started to study was what is the role of oxytocin? And this was based both on its role in maternal behavior and social monogamy um, and what we understood at the time. So oxytocin is a nine amino acid uh, polypeptide. It's produced in the hypothalamus of the brain, trafficked down neurons to the posterior pituitary where it's released into peripheral circulation and has a host of effects all pretty much related to muscle contractions uh, re related to reproduction. So uh, ejaculation, milk ejection for lactation, uterine contraction, those sorts of things. And one of the remarkable things about oxytocin and related peptides is the conservation of roles across the animal kingdom. So there's a, uh, an octopus version, a snail version, a leech version. If you inject um, conopressin into a snail, it will lay eggs. And if you, uh, if you inject the leech equivalent of one of these peptides, uh, it will go undergo a characteristic mating wriggle. So there's this really incredible conservation in the role of oxytocin related to reproduction. But then what we sort of layer on top of that is that oxytocin in the hypothalamus is also distributed to the brain where it has a lot of functions, some related to reproduction like maternal behavior, and then also related to other social functions, social recognition, pair bonding, things like that. Okay, then we have the receptor side of the story. At the top, you see two little pictures of brains. These are um, two species. I just uh, used images from two tuco tuco species here um, because this is a nice sort of visual demonstration of the striking difference between species in where oxytocin receptors are in the brain. So oxytocin always comes from the hypothalamus. It's distributed to the brain in a fairly, um, a fairly invariant way across species, but the receptor locations are highly variable. So that kind of led to this hypothesis that where the receptors are is a really flexible, fast way, evolutionarily speaking anyway, uh, to shape behavior. So species can diverge pretty dramatically from each other in terms of their receptor locations. Um, and you can see that sort of in this, in this map across the brain, this is nine different rodent species and where they have high, medium, and low levels of oxytocin receptor in the brain. And there are some of these brain regions where lots of species have lots of oxytocin receptor expression. Like a lot of these uh, amygdala nuclei have expression across species and others like the hippocampus where, you know, you can see in this top image, if you, this, this little bar across the top is the hippocampus and you can see one species has tremendous OTR binding there and the other almost entirely lacks it. All right, so we've got these sort of two parts of the system we can play with. And so what we started to ask in looking at the role of oxytocin in medical social behavior was first, let's look at those receptors and see how does oxytocin receptor density differ across day length. We've also looked at oxytocin. 
So for some of these, I'm just going to show you the answer. And for some of these, I'm going to walk you through the study. So here's one where I'm just going to show you the answer. It turns out that oxytocin receptor density is higher in winter-like short day lengths. Um, and that's been shown in two studies, one by Karen Parker and Terry Lee, um, and one that we did in our lab finding largely overlapping regions where the expression across the brain in all of the regions where there was a difference, um, it was higher in short days. We also found that oxytocin receptor density mapped onto individual behavior in a really beautiful way, particularly in the lateral septum, but um, that it seemed to be important for individual huddling behavior. Um, we also looked at oxytocin expression across the day lengths. We didn't find any difference there, but we did find that it flexibly, oxytocin neurons flexibly respond to different kinds of social cues. So if you put in uh, a vole, a meadow vole with a conspecific that it knows versus one that it doesn't know, you get different activity in oxytocin neurons. So you get this different response to familiar and novel social cues. And that's something you can find by co-labeling um, oxytocin and CFOS, an immediate early gene that's a marker of neural activation uh, in the hypothalamus. And then this is the one that I'm gonna walk you through. Then we got to the point where we said, okay, let's manipulate oxytocin and look to see how that influences social behavior. And we've done this a few different times now. All right, so anytime in the talk, you see a bunch of faces down in the bottom right, those are people who participated in the study um, or who worked on various uh, rounds of the study. Okay. So to do this study, what you do is you implant a cannula, which is just a little tiny tube into the brain of um, meadow vole. And you can either aim it at uh, the lateral ventricle and get the cerebrospinal fluid and sort of circulate it to the whole brain, or you can target it to a specific brain region. And the reason that you need to do this at all is that if you simply gave an injection of oxytocin into the periphery, oxytocin doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. So here you can deliver it directly to the cerebrospinal fluid, and then you can go further and target it to specific brain regions. And at this point, we've done this both uh, chronically in terms of a long-term infusion acutely um, and both into the ventricle and then into the specific parts of the brain. Okay. After you do this procedure, you allow the animals to recover. You pair them for 24 hours. They can be freely moving, social in their cage. Um, and then you give them a partner preference test. And 24 hours is normally sufficient for these metavoles to form a preference for that familiar cage mate. All right, so here's what happens when you infuse oxytocin into the lateral ventricle. So in the vehicle condition, that should be our control condition. We should see that animals are huddling more with the partner than the stranger. When we infuse oxytocin into this brain region, what happens instead is that animals spend more time huddling with the partner. They don't spend more time huddling overall, however. It seems like what's happening is they're becoming more selective for their partner. And if we administer oxytocin together with an oxytocin receptor antagonist, that's the OTA, that preference difference goes away. And if we just think, well, what about if we didn't really block all the oxytocin receptors and we add just a truly obscene amount of oxytocin receptor antagonist, we still don't eliminate the behavior. So that's really interesting. This sort of baseline preference behavior is not dependent on oxytocin, but oxytocin can enhance the selectivity of it. All right, so we were interested in where this effect is taking place in the brain, and there are a number of really good candidates. Um, and in the first two regions that we tried, much to our surprise, we got an opposite effect of oxytocin. So here, the vehicle, again, the animals are showing that, that classic sort of preference for the familiar over the unfamiliar individual. But when oxytocin gets added in, in this case, this is the central amygdala, we got largely the same results in the lateral septum. Um, that preference goes away entirely. So again, we're not changing the total amount of huddling, we're changing who that huddling is directed towards and being more willing to huddle with the stranger. And again, when we add oxytocin receptor antagonist, we restore the initial behavior. So this is less selective. And what this tells us is that oxytocin is having brain region specific effects on the selectivity of peer huddling. This is the first time um, that, uh, well, our lateral septum study was the first time that it was demonstrated that oxytocin could reduce the selectivity of partner preference. And I, I sort of, this didn't sit well with everything that we'd seen in the literature, 
Now we've seen it in two different brain regions. And I think it's part of the sort of larger emerging story on oxytocin, that it has a lot to do with social salience. It has a lot to do with social context. And like any other neurochemical in the brain, it's not going to always have one function. So you wouldn't say dopamine in the brain does this, right? It's involved in multiple different processes. And similarly, oxytocin in the brain is not always doing the same thing. In fact, it's having opposing uh, roles in different brain regions. So I find that interesting and also sort of feeds into this larger picture of where we often think of oxytocin as sort of this pro-social hormone, right? It's really playing key roles in the selectivity of social behavior. And I can't tell you which of these is more social, right? Is it more social to be highly selective for a partner over a stranger, or is it more social to be willing to huddle with a stranger that you've never met before? Um, so I would, I would cast this instead of as more social, less social as really important for selectivity. Okay. So now I want to move on to sort of the next question that we asked. Actually, this is the most recent question that we asked, but I'm going to introduce it second, which is what is the role of social motivation in the formation of these sort of social groups? And this is work that um, has been done, that we've done in prairie voles, um, as well as in meadow voles, in part because um, prairie vole mate relationships have already been well studied in terms of their dependence on dopamine signaling. So several studies from Su Xin Wang's lab have shown that dopamine signaling is very important and D1 and D2 receptors separately mediate different phases of pair bond formation. Um, dopamine interacts with oxytocin signaling in the nucleus accumbens. All right, so a long time ago, uh, I did a study in meadow voles just to see if dopamine was required for their social preference formation, and it was not. And then much more recently, uh, Nikki, Sarah, and Nastasha have been looking at prairie voles in contrast to meadow voles in our lab. And the comparisons that we've made, one of them is to look at within prairie voles, they also form these same sex peer partner preferences. That's a mouthful. So when they form those preferences, are they mediated in the same way as these mate relationships? Are these two kinds of relationships mediated one way within a species? Or is it the case that peer relationships are more of a category and that they're related to each other across species, even that differ in their, um, in their mating system? So uh, we started by looking at the role of dopamine in these peer relationships. Nikki tried many different doses of antagonist all the way up to the, to the point at which they start influencing other behaviors. And at no dose does a D1, D2 receptor antagonist influence the pairing behavior. So that seemed much more um, like the meadow voles. And then we asked for all three of these different groups, to what extent was behavioral motivation uh, really important for their social behavior and their, and their preference behavior. All right. So to measure behavioral reward and, and motivation, we need a way to sort of make the animals work to get to each other. There's no effort involved in the partner preference test. And you can't say whether the animals are huddling together because they're bored and that's just what they do, or if they would really work to get to each other. So initially we just tried to make the partner preference test harder. We inserted things into it like spiky rubber hairbrushes and wet sponges and contact paper, just to make it aversive to cross over to the partner. Uh, and what we learned is that voles either wouldn't cross like a tray of water, or they loved sitting on all of the different interesting objects that we'd put in their partner preference test, like these horse hairbrushes. Um, so we fell back on much more classic measures of motivation, uh, like socially conditioned place preference and operant conditioning with social rewards. So I'm just going to show you the second of these two. Um, for operant conditioning, not a lot of studies have looked at operant conditioning with a social stimulus as the reward, but it does go back in the literature quite some time. Um, there's an older study from 1971 where male rats would bar press to get access to an estrus female, where the, fe uh, the female would be delivered by the experimenter in through the roof of the cage. Uh, Allison Fleming's lab was studying maternal behavior and long ago did a study where they showed that moms, mom rats would bar press for access to pups, uh, which gives rise to one of these gems of a line in a study. With each bar press response, a rat pup rather than a fruit loop was delivered down a gentle chute into the hopper. So they actually used a food delivery device to deliver little rat pups into the mom as she lever pressed. <clears throat> 
More recently, um, a lot of work in Sam Golden's lab and others has built on this finding that uh, mice will actually bar press for opportunities to beat up on each other. So winner mice uh, will work for access to subordinates and they'll work for access to go in and be aggressive to subordinate um, males. And then there have been a handful of other studies uh, starting to look at social reward in other ways. So operant conditioning is sort of the most quantifiable way to, uh, to get at this social reward. It's also extremely laborious work that was done primarily by Sara Lopez in my lab, um, but several others as well. So first, what we did was we trained voles to access a reward that wasn't social. And that was to, to take them all through the phase, make sure they could learn to lever press, not all of our voles learned, um, and to be able to compare something across the species. So I'm just gonna show you a little video of a uh, vole pressing for food reward, checks the hopper, presses the lever, gets a pellet, noshes the little pellet, presses again, gets another pellet. All right, so that's our food setup. And then here's our social setup. So here we have two chambers and when the vole presses a lever, what that can do is raise a little door that allows access to a separate chamber that we've built where we've tethered the conspecific. Um, and that might be a same sex animal, an opposite sex animal, um, uh, or a familiar or an unfamiliar animal. So we tested all of these different groups. So when the door goes up, the animal can transition over to the other chamber. They get a minute to go socialize with the other animal, and then they get shooed back over into the main compartment where they can press again. And all of these studies were done on a progressive ratio study. So the more they get access to that uh, animal, the harder they have to work to get the next access to the animal. So here's a little video of that. Check the door, press the lever. Okay, now the door's up, go over. Oh, look, there's my buddy. And then they go and they interact and they get a minute to interact and then they have to do it all over again. All right. So to do this study, we took five different groups of animals. We took female prairie voles where they were focal and housed with a female. We took females housed with males where again, the females were focal. We took males housed with males. We took males housed with females where we're focused on the male behavior. And then we also took in, in meadow voles, it's the females that have this dramatic social behavior switch with the seasons. So we took female, female pairs of meadow voles. Everyone went through a shaping and training paradigm to learn to lever press and then got eight days of testing with a food reward to get a baseline lever pressing level for a non-social reward and to establish that they'd learned the task. They got two days of habituation to the social apparatus, to sort of learn how that apparatus worked. And then they went through eight consecutive days of testing with a partner and eight consecutive days of testing with eight different strangers where the order was counterbalanced between those two sections. Then they went through a control where they got to lever press for an empty chamber. And then they went through extinction in order to see what the baseline pressing would be when no reward was delivered at the end of the study. All right, so we have lots of really cool interesting differences between the prairie vole groups, but what I want to focus on here is the meadow vole social behavior. So the first thing that we're looking at here is the control data. This is sort of how did they behave uh, when given a food reward. In the top left panel, what you can see is there's no real difference between the species or between sexes in prairie voles in how much they responded in order to get a food reward. And that's good because it allows us to compare across these groups. We don't just have one species that learns and one species that doesn't learn how to do this task. The second panel there also looks like negative data, but it's the good kind of negative data. It tells us that their response rates for a food reward and the response rates for a social reward are unrelated to each other. And what that says to me is that we don't have super pressers who just press a lot for any kind of reward, whether it's social or food. So it tells us that they're altering their lever pressing effort depending on the stimulus that they're getting and that we don't just have high and low pressers. So these two controls sort of support the comparisons across the groups that we would like to make. So here are the data looking at prairie vole females and meadow vole females, these two sort of groups that could be directly compared. And each of the dots on this graph represents the average of eight days of testing of that animal in that condition. So we can also look within individuals and many of them form significant, uh, you know, show significant preferences for part pressing for their partner over their stranger. But this is the within groups comparison where each of the dots represents a different vole. So for each of those voles, they went through both conditions so we can look matched at their partner pressing and their stranger pressing. And what you should hopefully see in both 
of these groups is that both the prairie voles and the meadow voles pressed more when given access to a partner than when given access to a stranger. And what's kind of interesting here is that these are not like partner preference tests where they have both presented at the same time. They have only one social stimulus they can press for. They only get the stranger, they still press less for the stranger. They only get the partner, they still press more for the partner than they will later on for their stranger. All right, so familiarity seems to be really important for both the prairie and the meadow voles, but you'll also notice there's a big species difference in how much they're willing to work. Um, and in the upper ranges here, they're having to work tremendously more because of that progressive ratio schedule uh, in how much they'll work to gain access to these uh, different individuals. And we can close up on that. I'm here gonna show you in the, in the meadow voles, um, those two yellow bars are just repeated from the left, the partner and the stranger pressing. But now if we compare that to how much will they press for the empty chamber, oh, lo and behold, they actually press for the empty chamber just as much as they did the partner. So there's no additional reward offered by getting access to the partner over on top of being able to explore this other chamber. And similarly, when you look at data from these animals after they've undergone extinguishing where the lever doesn't control the door anymore, the, the amount that they lever press when the door doesn't even open is similar to the amount that they lever press when there's a stranger in that other chamber. So they lever press, they see the stranger, they don't go in and they you know, don't press a whole lot after that. So what this really says is that metavols are not really showing signs of social motivation, right? So they, they seem to show some aversion for the stranger. They will press less for the stranger than the partner. They don't really wanna go in and explore that chamber when it has the stranger in it. Um, but there's no positive signs of social motivation. All right, so summarizing sort of the three different research areas here, we saw that metavol peer relationships don't depend on dopamine signaling, unlike the prairie vol mate relationships. Metavol relationships, I didn't show you the data, but they don't lead to conditioned place preferences. So that was our first indication that maybe these uh, relationships aren't that rewarding. And then in a context where we can really measure social reward, uh, metavols won't work to access familiar voles any more than they will to access an empty chamber. And they seem to avoid unfamiliar voles. All right. So social reward is not a great hypothesis for why these voles are coming together and living in groups. And what does that leave us with? Well, for me, what that leads us with is uh, social tolerance or putting up with each other. And I actually kind of like this interpretation uh, or have, have come to think of this interpretation as maybe this is sort of what happens to an animal that isn't aggressive, that isn't afraid of other individuals, that if you take away the sort of antisocial forces that keep animals apart, animals will end up together without needing a whole lot of actual motivation or pro-social sort of interest to do so. Um, so that's what I've started to think about as sort of the neurobiology of this tolerance piece. And we already know that short day voles are more interactive with strangers. And here I just want to close up again on this graph that I showed you before looking at the day length differences. One of the things that, um, that we started to think about more is that stranger huddling piece. If you look in the short day females, these females are willing to huddle with strangers in a way that the long day females didn't seem to be. So uh, Nikki Lee in my lab put a, a number of voles through social interaction tests solely with strangers and found pronounced day length differences in how much they interacted socially in terms of huddling, grooming, and sniffing with those strangers that they'd never interacted with before. And here we're keeping everything else constant, including pair housing, um, the long day voles, which makes them substantially more social than they would be if they lived in a more sort of ecological, uh, solitary housing in long days. So there's this day length difference in that sort of stranger interaction. And then more recently, we've started to, to look in sort of more complex housing scenarios. And I'm really excited about sort of getting more rich data in the laboratory, not confining ourselves to partner preference tests and social interaction tests and these sort of batteries of tests, but studying more sort of free living behavior in the lab. And so this apparatus has a cage, more than enough cages for each vole to stake out their own zone on their own. And there are little um, radio antennas on each end of the tube and then animals have a, a pit chip in them and so they can get tracked um, both by video and by RFID tags as they meander through the apparatus. And in our very first sort of pilot studies of this apparatus, 
um, we can show that animals housed in long days and short days put four unfamiliar animals into this apparatus monitored just for one day. We could keep them in there for weeks, but just this is just the first day of interaction. And we find that the short day animals spend more time uh, in social interaction defined as being in the same compartment as someone else than the long day animals do. And then of that time that they are in the chamber together, we can build up this model from the RFID reads of where is each individual. And so we can build up a model of how many individuals are in a chamber as well. And we can say, okay, of that time that they are in a group, now we're only looking at the group time, how big is that group? So the minimum would be two because that's a pair and the maximum in this case is four because that's how many animals we put in the apparatus. And you can see that the short day animals are also in larger groups when they are in groups together. So this is just on that first day of social interaction. Um, and we're looking forward to looking at how do these, uh, you know, how do the social networks develop between these four animals? How do they change over time? How do they look different between these two groups? So um, this is work that was done with uh, Nikki Lee and Kelly Power in my lab. All right, so um, we can start to look at the role of lots of different behaviors in sort of shaping this grouping behavior. And one of the sort of candidates that I think is really important for this sort of social tolerance idea is how anxious are these animals um, and, uh, and how does their sort of stress hormone signaling or HPA axis signaling rather um, change seasonally. So here, I'm gonna skip over this because I wanna get to the last three slides on Tuco Tuco. So I'll just say that we asked what changes in HPA axis hormone signaling might kind of support this kind of behavior. We, we've so far looked at corticosterone, corticosterone binding globulin and CRF receptors. And all three of these findings are consistent I'm skipping over all of this stuff, are consistent with the idea that reduced avoidance and anxiety in short day lengths might promote social behavior. But there's a lot that we actually have to do to manipulate these systems to know that that's the case. Right now, this is all sort of correlational evidence. Um, so this is an area that we're very interested in sort of pursuing this idea of what is the basis of social tolerance. Um, and our next step is to manipulate. All right, so this is the cartoon version of everything we talked about. We have differences in the field in terms of metavol behavior. When we bring them into the lab, we have differences in behavior across day length. And then when we start to drill down into mechanisms, we find that there are differences in the brain across short days and long days in multiple receptor systems, differences in circulating hormones. Uh, I didn't talk about the autonomic nervous system changes, but there are changes in, in ANS regulation as well. And then we can start to piece together, not only are there these changes, but which of these changes directly influence the social behavior of these animals. Okay, so that's that middle portion. And I have just a few slides on sort of those additional approaches, because I think that as much as we learn about metavoles and their social behavior, the ultimate goal is to be able to compare this across species. Um, so both, uh, both from metavoles to prairievoles, but also in a broader context. So before I sort of introduced you to this idea that maybe social organization is associated with some sort of species specific pattern of receptor binding. And this is an image from an old insulin young paper looking at monogamy and prairie voles and montane voles in this case, and sort of the distribution of oxytocin receptors and social behavior. And here, this is a totally unreadable chart. I'm about to color code it for you. But, um, but if we look across lots and lots of species at different patterns of, of receptor binding, unfortunately, what we we find is that most of the studies, including my own, uh, examine one or two species within a genus, and that can't really be generalized across the genus. Um, so you can see we have two tuco tucos, a guinea pig, rat, mouse, two paramiscus species. And the goal really here now is to examine these sorts of neurobiological traits consistently in an evolutionary framework. And so that's the project that I've been working on for over a decade now. This is, this is one of those lessons, field research never goes to plan. Um, in collaboration with Eileen Lacey, Enrique Lessa, Ana Paula Cutrera, Dick Sage, and Lauren Hayes, um, collecting animals from across this group of South American rodents, the Tuco Tucos, and then Degus and Caruros, to look to see, is there in fact a pattern of oxytocin receptor expression in the brain that's associated with group living. And then the other thing that we'll definitely find, even if there is no pattern associated with group living, is we're gonna learn a lot about how plastic or constrained is oxytocin receptor binding across this tree. Um, so I'm gonna show you some teaser data as my last 
data here. So this is going from the front to the back of the brain across, I think here we've got seven of the species. We've, we've assayed nine different species now, and I'm waiting to get one more social species to put this all together and do the quantification. But uh, Argentina got rid of export permits for a number of years, and then we had some samples thaw. Uh, at one point, a permit office burned down. There have been a few roadblocks to getting uh, a last social species. But what you can just see here visually is the incredible and impressive variety of oxytocin receptor binding patterns across this genus. And then you can also see that there are some areas that are really highly conserved. So in the middle, if, you, if you're a neuroanatomist and you know your lateral septum, there's beautiful lateral septum binding across these species, more in some and less in others. Um, and I'll be really interested to, to be able to report to you someday um, whether or not these binding patterns relate to social behavior. But our preliminary data, um, we really need a social species that is not at the base of the tree, um, but our preliminary data suggests that uh, without that, it looks like there are in fact strong patterns that go along with social behavior. We just can't disentangle them from phylogeny yet. All right, so stay tuned. So what have we learned? Voles provide two really interesting opportunities in the lab with regard to social behavior beyond pair bonding. One is the ability to study selective social preferences, even for peers. Um, and then the other is to study the factors that mediate this transition in social behavior um, that I think provides a really good opportunity to start to isolate some of the things that happen in the brain that support social behavior. And then comparisons of these relationships, both between species and within species, um, should hopefully improve our understanding of the specificity or the universality of the mechanisms that we find, right? So uh, when I think translation, I kind of think about sideways translation. Does this, does this translate to uh, what we learn in other species? Because as we saw in the beginning, there are a lot of different kinds of social groups. And what we may find is that groups of a particular sort rely on social reward and certain types of pathways in different ways than other kinds of social groups. So with that, I will finish my talk and share some acknowledgements. This is my lab uh, pre-COVID. And then I, I have a, a more recent picture here of uh, the, the individuals who, who bravely clustered together and took their masks off for a moment for a group photo. So, um, and of course, now I'm gonna have a, a new lab group and new photo starting soon. So thank you very much. And I look forward to, to answering any questions that you have. Lauren, do, do you want to take the first few minutes? Or I'll, I'll like take the, to... I can take the first few minutes and then transition to you later. Have you made okay. me co-host? Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks, Annalise. That was really cool. Um, so now we have a chance for a question and answer. And just to remind you, um, if you have a question, please uh, put a question mark in the chat. And uh, at first, I'll start off. And then when I have to leave, Eduardo will take over. And um, when you ask your question, please introduce yourself. We're trying to build a community. So just tell us your name and where you're from. And for those of you watching YouTube, uh, please um, put your question in the comments and one of us will relay that to Annalise. Okay, so we'll start off with Eduardo, please. Well, thank you, Annalise, for a fascinating talk. Very, very interesting. I have lots of questions. I want to start with one that comes from the first part of the presentation. I, when you shared with us the comparative data on peer partner preference, and you were showing us data on the mouse, on the rats, on the meadow voles, et cetera, you were explaining how it, it was the mouse and the rats that didn't really, I mean, they, they had very low responses. My first reaction, I think you were showing five different taxa, uh, I was wondering if there is the possibility that one ought to consider the extent to which the mice and rats that you work with have very, very different genetic makeup from degus and bulls and things. I mean, it, it, how you're interested, I mean, we're all interested in the audience in trying to understand the evolutionary reasons behind what we observe. Mm -hmm. I, I'm assuming that your mice and rats have been bred in captivity for how many generations and the extent to which that may have, they, that may explain in itself the pattern response. 
yeah, compared that's to a, the others? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. We thought about that and intentionally tested, uh, well, two strains of lab mice, C57s, um, and, and one other strain of lab mice, and then the, the rats were long Evans rats. Um, because that's the, those, are, those are some of the dominant models used in the lab to study behavior by researchers who are saying, you know, here we're studying the neurobiology of social behavior in mice. They're using these inbred lab strains. So I would not presume to say that that represents the behavior of mice that are wild or, uh, or rats that are, that are wild. Uh, Michael Taborski also did a study looking at social preferences in Norway rats and didn't find uh, that they formed social preferences. He didn't test them in the partner preference test per se, but he did a very similar kind of setup looking for peer social preferences and didn't find them. Um, I know that there are, you know, there are opportunities to, to study uh, na natural populations of these. So for example, Michael Nachman has these uh, wild derived, but now inbred mice from Brazil and New York City that, that could be a more sort of relevant uh, to field data um, way to characterize mouse behavior or rat behavior. Um, but in this case, I was really, really more focused on that question of what are we learning about the animals that we're studying, right? When people study rats in the lab and they typically use these inbred strains or when people use study mice in the lab, are they studying a species that seems to show these kinds of social preferences? So mice in particular, because of all the genetic tools that we can use, have become a really prominent species in the study of, of laboratory social behavior, all sorts of studies on the role of oxytocin and signaling in the brain and social behavior. Um, so I think it's important to know something about the preference behavior of these lab mice in particular. Um, but I do actually love the idea of taking, this is an assay that you can take to the field. Um, it's not that hard to do to test animals with a familiar animal and, a, and an unfamiliar animal. We've built this apparatus in different sizes for different species. It's, it's feasible to do this in the field. And I think it would be really nice to do whether a partner preference test per se, or maybe other kinds of social interaction tests. I think it'd be really nice to characterize behavior in lots of different species. So, so as we go and get oxytocin receptor data from the brains of these different wild tuco tuco species, wouldn't it be nice to also be able to go and characterize their social behavior one by one to have more detailed behavior to overlay that sort of neural data on, not just, you know, this one's group living and this one's not group living. So I think that's a really great question. Yes, just a small follow-up, right? Because my concern is that precisely because probably in the audience, most of us have the concern of what is it really that we're learning from mm -hmm. rats and mice when we look at preference tests in absolutely inbred rats and mice. My concern is that if we present it in the context of a comparison across taxa, as opposed to presented in the context of a comparison inbred, non-inbred, those who look at mice and think that they're learning something about that may be of relevance in a broader context, maybe missing the point that you're really, you're not. I mean, mm -hmm. what, what I'm getting from your picture is more, not that they're not showing preference, is that guys, you need to reassess if this is a good, a good model for understanding something that you hope to be applicable outside your inbred mm -hmm. mice. Mm -hmm. Because given when we look at things that are not inbred, they're totally different. Yeah, and nobody's done that. I mean, it's it's not uh, the partner preference test has been extended to a number of different species. A number of people have done partner preference tests in California mice, in striped mice, in uh, in other species to look at whether these preferences form. But it's almost always done in an opposite sex context to see if mate preferences are formed. Um, and and I I mean I think zebra finches and uh, maybe one or two other bird studies are the only instance I can think of. Um, actually, um, TT monkeys also. So in, in primates and birds and all the rodents that we've studied, there have been these sort of peer partner preference tests, but I think it's an important, it's a really important indicator of behavior. Do, does an organism exhibit a preference for a familiar over an unfamiliar animal? It seems like a fairly fundamental behavioral trait to assess. And it, it really hasn't been assessed in very many species. So I would encourage anyone working with wild mice to, to go ahead and run the, the, the peer partner preference test. Feel free to hit me up for advice or apparatuses or, or anything like that. I think it would be really good to know. Thank you.
Okay, so our next question comes from Tony. Hi, Annalise. Thank you. That was a, a really fascinating talk. And I also, uh, you know, uh, systems that I don't think at all about uh, very often. Um, I wanted to jump back to the first part of the, the talk as well. Uh, and this might not be data, this isn't data, at least the data you presented isn't data that you had, but it was from Madison, but looking at the, the seasonal differences in territories and territory size and sociality in the meadow voles, right? And so you show this really beautiful comparison from Madison's data in the individual territories that suddenly there's, there's, there's overlap. And one of the things that struck me is, is some of those territories, uh, at least from the figures that you showed, look like animals aren't changing the size. Some individual animals aren't changing the size of their territories over time. And some individuals stick around uh, is, as in not being social to the extent that others are, right? So there's a lot of variation in how, how much overlap there is and how territories expand, and which brought uh, for me, the idea of how much individual variation there is in this kind of seasonal change. Um, thoughts, uh, thoughts about that? I know those aren't, aren't data that you collected. Yeah, and I'd love to actually, so I've worked with the meadow voles in the field, but largely for the purposes of outbreeding our colony, I'll go and trap them, quarantine them, import them, and, and go through that sort of process. But I'd love to do more field work with meadow voles in the future. But I guess this is the sort of the, the flip side of not using inbred laboratory rodents, right? Is that is that our colony is, is quite outbred. We capture wild caught animals every three to five years and bring them into the population to keep it outbred. And, uh, and then in studying behaviors, we do have a lot of individual variation. And my approach to that is just to try and make use of that by when we look at hormone and brain measures, we get those on an individual level. So we can look at the, the big differences between long days and short days, and then we can look at the individual differences. Um, for example, I think I showed uh, at least the conclusion that the individual huddling behavior correlates with oxytocin receptor density in the lateral septum of the brain. And, uh, and interestingly, that's a pooled finding from across short days and long days. So we do have short day animals that huddle less than long day animals. And we have some long day animals that'll huddle a lot. Um, but when we start to look at these, at these things that are changing in the brain and the endocrine system, sometimes what we find is that those patterns persist and, and are at least, um, as explanatory as day length. So the day length changes, we certainly lose a lot of the signal when we reduce it down to just a length in the lab, um, the differences between long days, the fact that they persist and allow us to study those differences is major, but in the field, you have so many other factors reinforcing that seasonal difference. So you have temperature, you have food availability. That's a big one actually, because if, um, if metavoles are exposed to 6-MBOA, which is a compound that's found in young growing green vegetation, it'll actually override the day length signal and facilitate reproduction in short day length. So it's a, it's a really nice signal of a mild winter if you encounter fresh growing greens in the middle of the winter season. Um, the other thing that I think is sort of relevant to what you were saying is that there's actually a process over time that I didn't go into where Metavole groups change in their composition over the winter. So at the start of the fall, um, the group composition primarily consists of a mother and her undispersed offspring. And then they will sort of stay together as a group as winter onsets. But the problem is that predation is so high in, in meadow voles, the average lifespan of one of these voles, they can live up to a couple of years, but they, they on average live two months in the field uh, because everything eats meadow voles. And so predation is so high that the groups have to then sort of become flexible. So after predation, there's immigration into the groups and they're quite flexible through the middle of winter by December. And this is from Dale Madison and William McShay's field data. They're no longer related to each other. So these groups are now composed of unrelated individuals. And then by spring, they start to solidify and, and become less flexible to new immigrants. And then oftentimes females and males that are in those groups in uh, the spring will actually breed and then, um, and then the male will eventually leave uh, the female behind, but they sort of 
form these breeding groups. And they've even discovered, this kind of goes back to a comment that happened before the talk, the more you look, the more you find in terms of behavior, they've even found meadow voles, aloe nursing, other females, youngs in little cooperative breeding groups in the spring, but only in the spring and only that first round of reproduction after the winter. And after that, they're intolerant of each other and they won't, they won't be in groups. So there's this interesting progression over time that we've never really managed to, to probe in the lab because we lose a lot of the seasonal information. I don't know that we would have the same kind of social behavior progression where, you know, if you remove animals in pseudo predation and then they'd be willing to meet with other animals, but then later on they wouldn't. Uh, we find that they are quite flexible in the lab in terms of who they will form a preference for, but that they are forming these preferences. They're not oblivious to who it is that we introduce them to. Thank you. Okay, so our next question comes from Karsten. Yes, hello, I'm Karsten Schradin at the CNRS in Strasbourg, France, doing field studies in South Africa. Thanks for a great and interesting talk. I mean, the system with the meta is from um, being highly aggressive in the breeding season and forming groups is really amazing. And there are these different aspects from aggression to becoming um, tolerant, social attraction, and then um, having some partner preferences. And in your last um, answer, you indicated that the starting of the groups in autumn is um, because mother families develop, the, the, the offspring do not, do not disperse. So I think um, one, one very important aspect here, and I think you mentioned it quickly in your talk, is um, not only the tolerance, but also the absence of aggression, because it seems when the aggression doesn't develop, then the groups automatically form. So mm -hmm. if you look at, at the role of estrogen and estrogen receptor alpha and, and these aspects, because I mean, I think this onset of aggression is the main thing that makes them solitary, isn't it? Um, in a prairie vole, I would agree. When we've done comparisons, uh, when we've done aggression tests in the meadow voles and the prairie voles, we have to stop all of our aggression tests in prairie voles quite early because they are so aggressive. Uh, towards conspecifics that they don't know in many cases. Um, in the meadow voles, uh, that sort of reduced regress uh, aggression may be part of how they can sort of have these groups become more flexible in the winter, but they're not really all that aggressive in our laboratory setting um, in long days. So for example, we can pair adult animals from solitary housing into a partnership with another adult animal and they do fine. Um, that said, um, so, and we also haven't seen really pronounced differences in aggression across the day lengths, um, although we could do more to look at that. Um, but you're right that um, estrogen signaling changes dramatically across these day lengths, right? Because in the summer day length, they are reproductively active. Um, they're, they have both active uh, steroid hormone circulation and their reproductive structures are much larger in the summer day length. And all of that regresses in winter as reproduction shuts down. So they have a decrease in circulating estradiol, a decrease in uterine diameter or mass. Um, we looked at estrogen receptor alpha. I've never published these results, but um, we didn't find any day length differences in estrogen receptor alpha in, we looked at the medial amygdala after, um, some papers looking at estrogen receptor alpha and social organization um, in other species. And, and that didn't seem to change, but, but sort of like the oxytocin story, it's, you don't need both pieces to change, right? If you have a change in signaling of one, um, the, the receptor doesn't need to change and you can still have a change in the overall signaling. So yeah, I think that estrogen, um, and, and we have data that supports that estrogen, estradiol in particular is, is important in the seasonal transition. If you, um, if you take away estradiol, it's not sufficient to promote social behavior. It's not the only factor that's changing, but if you give estradiol to a short day vole, it actually does impair their social behavior. So it's not a reciprocal relationship. It's not the only thing that's changing, but estradiol does seem to impair their social behavior. I'm not sure if it's through aggression so, though. So are you suggesting they are not solitary because they become aggressive and territorial, but because they lose social attractiveness and then just um, put themselves into an organization with resource distribution and then automatically they, they become solitary because they're not attracted to each other and every 
FEMA looks for its best um, home range with the best um, resources. I guess I wouldn't go so far as to say it's not that they become territorial and aggressive. It's that maybe other pieces of that, like, for example, social anxiety plays a bigger role than the aggression, um, lack of attraction to other individuals. Yeah, I think I think I would say that they they find other individuals less less attractive, whether that's, you know, anxiety or something else. And there are differences in, in aggression in the field. We just don't recapitulate those under only day length conditions in the lab. But again, we could look at that more. Um, we haven't seen them in, in just one small sample of aggression tests that we did. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to relay a question now from YouTube. Uh, this is from Clara G. Um, in consecutive trials for one individual, and if so, oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, first of all, she says, thanks for an interesting talk. Uh, she says, in your social reward experiment, did you test motivation to reach a peer in consecutive trials for one individual? And if so, did you make sure that their motivation is not saturated after a few minutes versus seeking for a mate in an empty chamber? Um, I'm not exactly sure if I understand the nature of the question, but what I can do is I can describe the setup that we used. So um, trials were a half an hour long and they only had one half hour long trial per day. Um, so when they had eight days of testing, that was eight consecutive days of a half an hour on each of the days. And um, so if we had run, sometimes people in running progressive ratio trials will run them until they sort of stop lever pressing or you know, hit their break point. We had a, a ceiling of a half an hour that we tested for. Um, and, then, and then you can either look at the break point that they got up to in that half hour, or you can look at the total number of lever presses that they exhibited during that period of time to get to the, to the partner animal. So the, the consecutive tests with the, the peer and the consecutive tests with the unfamiliar animal were happening on different days. So presumably they would, they would sort of come into each session uh, fresh on that day, but they were also housed with their partner right up until that test. So they were the, the, the prairie voles, which exhibited quite a lot of social motivation to get to their partners. Um, they had no social deprivation whatsoever. So they go right into an apparatus where that partner you were just hanging out with a minute ago is on the other side of a barrier. And they worked pretty hard to get across that barrier to that partner. Um, and prairie voles show all sorts of interesting, you know, consolation behaviors. Who knows if they think that their partner is in distress and they want to go and sit by the partner. Um, I can't speak to any of the, of the sort of the factors that go into that social motivation, except to say that the prairie voles showed quite a bit of social motivation to go over and be near the partner. And there were also really interesting sex differences for the prairie voles. Um, the prairie vole females worked very hard to go get to a familiar female and they worked equally hard to go get to a familiar male, a mate. Um, and they did not work as hard to get to an unfamiliar animal. The males worked tremendously hard to get to any female, whether it was familiar or not. And then when they get there, then they show the species typical preference behavior where they huddle with the animal. If it's a familiar partner, they don't huddle with the animal. If it's not a familiar partner, in some cases they mounted the, the unfamiliar female. In some cases, uh, they tried to mate with it. Um, so, uh, so we get this, this difference, not in the preference behavior, but in the sort of the, 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 the interest in working to get to this uh, social stimulus in the male and the female prairie voles. But both of them worked quite hard to get to at least a familiar social stimulus, or in the case of males, at least a, a female um, social stimulus, whereas the meadow voles really didn't, uh, didn't work very hard to get over there. So... And I'll just uh, make a comment to Clara on YouTube. If you have a follow-up question, please post it and we can uh, pass it on to Annalise. Um, our next question in the queue comes from Jingyu. Hello, I'm Jingyu. I'm a PhD student at Cinewest. Uh, we're working with Karsten. So, my, so I'm curious about how strong this peer relationship can be. So in the field, uh, have you observed any long-term peer relationships that can last for more than one winter. So do they prefer to group with individuals that they grouped with the year before, or do they just group with the nearest one that's most convenient to form a group? 
So we have uh, not done a study of them in the, in the field like that, but there have been many field studies of medical social behavior in the lab. And I can tell you why nobody has answered that question. And it's because so few voles live to overwinter uh, and, and last to the next year. And the idea that they're that their group members would also manage to, to live to the next year and be able to form that group. So I can tell you with some certainty that the answer is no, they don't for, reform consistent groups again the next year, but that's only based on, on the knowledge that so few of their group members would even be available that even if they wanted to come back with those original members, they might retain social memory over that period of time of their former group members, I don't know. In the lab, um, studies have tested the longest duration that uh, that they'll maintain a partner preference for. This is some work done by Karen Parker and Terry Lee. And I believe they showed that for two, you can separate meadow voles for two weeks um, and put them back together and they will still prefer the animal, uh, put them in a partner preference test. And then they'll still prefer the animal that they knew two weeks ago over one that they haven't encountered before. So that's the limit to which that's actually been tested. Um, in the lab, but um, but that's actually longer than anyone has shown that prairie voles maintain partner preferences for. So at least for a period of a few weeks, they they retain that that social interest that's that's differential. So do you think uh, it's two weeks uh, is quite long, like compared to the life lifespan? Or <laughs> well, compared to the to average of two months, but not. I mean, in the lab, we have these guys going, you know, slightly over two years. So. Uh, it, it's the sort of thing where, where I suppose we could test it in the lab, but I'm not sure if it would have too much ecological uh, relevance to know if they would full, you know, prefer an animal that they knew the year before. I will say though, that I don't expect it for another reason, which is that um, in the winter, um, when they're forming these larger groups, Naomi Androsik actually did a really neat experiment where she compared preference for a partner versus preference for a trio of voles in long days and short days and female voles in short day lengths prefer, uh, they lose the preference to huddle for their partner over three stranger voles. They actually like to go huddle with that trio of stranger voles. So, um, we'll probably test this a little bit more directly with all strangers and look at a single stranger versus a trio of stranger and do some group preference tests. But, um, but that sort of goes along with this idea that uh, this sort of the finding that we had in the RFID apparatus, they're starting to prefer a larger group. They're willing to make that larger group with strangers. And, and they even seem to like that large group more than a single familiar individual. That group starts to have some salience to them. Okay, thank you. Okay, hey, so the next question, um, and I'm just going to comment, Eduardo, I'm going to turn it over to you after this. Um, the next question is from Zulema. And I'm, since I'm leaving soon, Annalise, thank you. Wonderful job. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Hi, this is Zulema Tang Martinez at the University of Missouri St. Louis, <clears throat> and I'm retired. Um, wonderful talk. Annalise, and I have a question, and it's possible that you mentioned this and I missed it, and it also is somewhat relevant to what she and you asked um, in the previous question. Um, do you have any evidence or any studies looking at whether um, voles have a preference for particular individuals that is consistent over time? Like I'm thinking in terms of humans, there's some people, I see them, I would love to go up and talk to them. Other, other ones, you know, I really don't particularly want to interact with them. And I'm wondering, given that you've looked at so much individual differences in your work, whether there's any evidence that, that these preferences are um, lasting preference and whether uh, there are some strangers in particular that they would rather not associate with versus ones that they consistently prefer to associate with. That's a great question. So I think rather embarrassingly, we form all the partnerships that our voles get to have in the lab, right? We pair voles and then they form a partner preference. So every now and then you find 
that there's a vole that has not formed a partner preference. So you'll have, you know, all of your ones that prefer the partner. And then one of them goes and huddles with the stranger a lot. And that there, there's always one of those voles if you have a large enough sample size. And that's true with prairie voles and mate partner preference. And it's true with the meta voles and the, and the peer partner preference. Um, you can get rid of that effect by housing them together for longer. So if you house them for a month before you do your partner preference test, more of them show a really robust partner preference. Um, but there are perhaps some pairings that were a little bit incompatible that we make in the lab and, and we wouldn't know. One of the things I'm really excited about with our RFID apparatus is that animals are finally gonna be in groups, right? We're gonna study group living animals in groups and they'll be allowed to self-assort. And so, um, and we know who's in the chamber with whom we can create social network maps of who they're hanging out with. Um, we haven't had this apparatus up and running for very long. The one run that we did where we created social network diagrams, we put a bunch of prairie voles of both uh, male and female prairie voles into the apparatus. I think we had seven or eight of them. And then we watched how that social network changed over time. And then we just used it to validate the apparatus. Like the ones that hang out, this, this male seems to like this female, put them in a partner preference test with that female and a different female. And he also prefers her in that context. Um, but we definitely could see that there were dynamics where certain animals hung out with certain other animals more than the other ones. So I'm really looking forward to looking at that question and sort of looking at those specific social interactions, but we haven't been able to do it yet. And I think that the RFID apparatus will let us do it. Yeah, great, thanks. The next question is from Clara Jones. Hi. Um, Thanks for the talk. It seems to me that a lot of your observations with respect to proximity, huddling, and the what you call motivation to choose or to select partners, it seems to me that a lot of that could be interpreted as thermoregulation. I wonder if you could comment on that. Absolutely. And I didn't show you the data for this, but that was the very first question that came up when we started to see, oh, look, these short day animals are huddling more. The long day animals are huddling less. Even though we're housing them in the same uniform temperature, what if their internal body temperature rhythms change with the day length we expose them to? Or what if just the time of day at which we're testing them, you know, as they, voles have ultradian rhythms in body temperature and activity and a number of other factors, we have them at synchronized lights off. They have different lights on time. So what if their internal body temperatures are different at the time of day that we test them and they're huddling because they're cold? Um, the good news is, is that it doesn't seem like that's the case. So um, I implanted internal, uh, just eye buttons, little internal um, temperature monitoring devices and gathered weeks of data from several different voles housed in long days and short days. And um, they had the same mean body temperature. They don't have the same mean anything else. Their heart rate is different. All sorts of other things are different, but they have the same mean internal body temperature when we house them in long days and short days. And they do in fact have differences in their body temperature rhythms that mean that if we tested them in the morning, they would have different internal body temperatures. So we actually do all of our partner preference testing um, between noon and lights out because that's a time when their temperature rhythms sync up before they have a uniform lights out time. So I think it's a really important question to consider. Um, and I think it's not an issue because of the way that we do our testing, but absolutely, I think that's that's the driver of huddling behavior. The other thing I can say is that um, is that uh, Naomi Androsik did some experiments with um, looking at animals in the cold and also with food restriction to say, when you pile other variables on top of day length, how does that impact huddling behavior? And, um, and I can't remember exactly right now, um, it, the results were more complicated than just a straightforward, oh yes, they huddle more in short days. But when you house animals in um, it, with food restriction and colder temperatures, that also influences their social behavior um, as you would expect. Thanks a lot. Thank you, great question. Next question comes from Kaya Tombak. Kaya? Hi there, can you hear me okay? Mm-hmm. 
Okay, um, I'm a bit shy to ask this question because I had to step away for a minute. So if you already addressed it, you can ignore me. But did you already get to talk, talk about the degus and why you think that they might have had such different um, responses, especially with the huddling with a stranger um, than the other species and whether how that might make sense with their you know, social systems? I didn't, and um, and uh, there are other people here who know Daegu's much more than I do, but um, my understanding is that Daegu social groups in the wild are relatively small female-based groups that are also flexible. So the membership is not, it's not, it's not like one of these groups where, you know, like the meadow voles in, you know, spring where they would be closed to new membership. Um, and so, Maybe, and this is going out on a limb here, maybe their lack of partner preference goes along with sort of the social flexibility and the fact that groups are not consistent from year to year, that they allow immigration into the group, that there's that there is that sort of social flexibility. So um, that's that's definitely overreaching the data a little bit, but that's sort of how it makes sense to me that they they don't seem to show these partner preferences. Um, I'll say that uh, the other person who's done some same sex partner preference testing um, more recently is um, Aubrey Kelly. She's done it in her spiny mice. And spiny mice uh, are also very sort of gregariously social. They'll form these very flexible groups. You can toss 10 spiny mice in with each other and they don't know each other and they're not aggressive hardly at all. And they also don't seem to show, now I don't think she's done full three hour tests, um, but they also don't seem to show partner preferences. Um, so. I would love to make the grand claim that this is like a fundamental attribute of social groups that we could study broadly across all sorts of different rodents. I'd love to characterize tons more rodents, right? And say, which ones have the selectivity and which ones don't? And then is there something that goes along with that selectivity that we find? For example, you know, only prairie voles and a few other vole species are monogamous but maybe all the voles have selectivity preferences to some extent through some shared evolutionary origin. And it's just that, um, and it's just that it's not always relevant in a mating context if you're busy being territorial and separate and all of those sorts of other things. So I would love to survey this trait broadly. I don't know if I'll get the opportunity to, but, um, but I think it's, it's a really interesting one to look across different groups. And the ones that we've looked with have been largely a matter of convenience. I meet someone who's excited to do peer partner preference testing and, and we can go ahead and do it. And so Melissa Holmes is now doing this in her naked mole rats. I know Eileen Lacey is doing this with her tuco tucos in the lab. Um, and uh, anybody else wants to do it, just ask me how. We that makes perfect a, sense, thanks. I have another question, but if anybody who hasn't asked has one, please, we, we can type question mark right now and I will take you first. If not, I'll, I'll take another question, um, which I think builds on comments and questions by Xin Yu, by Zulema. If you studied the presentation uh, alluding to the fact that you don't feel comfortable talking about friendships among voles, and so you, you choose peer over friends. For those of us studying primates, we would probably have called them friendships, but I agree with you that what I'm trying to get at is that we definitely need to be clear on what we're referring to. We can call it whatever we want as long as we're clear. And that's where I, I, I'm hoping you, you can help me go home with, with even more understanding of how you guys studying rodents are referring to relationships, interactions, peers, because it, I think you did discuss this, but, but I apologize if I didn't, I don't remember it well. You talk about relationships. When I think of relationships, I think they're very different from interactions. But for mm -hmm. me to be thinking about two animals having a relationship, it means that something happened in the past that it's influencing an upcoming interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, can, can you elaborate a little bit on how, uh, how, how when, when I read the literature on rodents, how are you thinking of relationships as opposed to interactions? I think that peers and friends, I'm okay. We can call them either way. Uh, but, but relationships and interactions, that describing a relationship is so much, so, so much more difficult than mm -hmm. describing an interaction, right? Yeah, and I think part of 
part of the reason that I use the word relationship is that the alternative in the, in the vole world is pair bond, right? That's what most people study mm. in prairie voles is the pair bond, which, which is sort of characterized by two features. One is the, you know, the preference for that reproductive partner. And the other is the simultaneous increase in aggression towards all the other possible animals you might interact with. So after an animal's pair bonded, they actually become more aggressive towards unfamiliar conspecifics. And so in backing off from that, because these, what I call peer relationships and metavoles are certainly different from that kind of reproductive pair bond, but I do think that they fit the definition of relationship that you just sort of said of that there's sort of something in the past influences their behavior in the future. So the fact that we've housed these animals together and given them 24 hours to sort of become familiar with each other means that now when we test them, they act differently in response to that previous housing. They will prefer the partner almost all of the time, right? There's that one rogue vole that prefers the stranger, but almost all of the time, they'll prefer the partner that they have experience with over the stranger. And that's true. We don't usually separate them in between the housing and the testing, but you can, you can separate them for up to two weeks and you still get that preference for the partner over the stranger. So I call that a relationship largely to distinguish it from all of the work in, for example, mice and rats, where they don't seem to be these lasting relationships, at least under normal conditions. So uh, you can manipulate mice and rats to cause them to form partner preferences under certain cases. And sometimes, uh, especially I think in wild mice, they'll form uh, nursing coalitions between females under some certain circumstances. But in most of the conditions under which people work with lab rats and lab mice, they are just sort of being gregariously social. They will interact with each other and they're not showing that long-term history of interaction influencing a future preference. That said, they have individual recognition, they form dominance hierarchies, right? It's not, you know, depending on how broad you wanna use that term relationship, it's not social knowledge free, right? There's a lot of social knowledge that goes into their social interactions. So I'm using relationship for these sort of Part, peer partner preferences. Peer partner preferences is clearly not a term that I can use regularly, um, but I, I'm definitely always interested in, in the right language to use for this. At one point, I think Hans Hoffman said to me, I should be calling these platonic relationships. The peer relationships was really clunky and the platonic was better. And um, I, I haven't hit on a magical term that I think describes these social interactions that aren't just one-off social interactions. It's really a lasting preference. And I do think of it as a, as a relationship between these voles that have been housed together. They now prefer each other. No, but I, thank you very much. This really helps me. I think it's kind of probably a futile exercise to be thinking that we're gonna find a magic word. I don't <laughs> have sophisticated descriptions of what you mean by that word. That, that okay. I think that's what we really need to understand. Now, along the same lines, can you remind me a, for your testing protocols, what does it mean to be a stranger? What a stranger, strangers? yeah. So the stranger is a is a novel, unfamiliar conspecific. So it's an animal. In our case, when we do peer partner preference testing, when we use uh, the same sex paradigm, it's an, a sex matched animal. So if I'm testing a female as a focal, then both the partner the cage mate and the stranger, the novel animal are also gonna be females, but the stranger is an animal they've never encountered never. before. Okay, okay, good, thank you. Uh, I, let me see, uh, there's a comment from Suleyma. Would you like me to read this, Suleyma? You wanna mention this? Is this a question? I, uh, yeah, no, I can, I can comment. Um, it, it has to do with the um, Tara's question about thermal regulation. And I was just thinking that if we were dealing primarily with thermal regulation, then you would expect that the voles, the, the subject vole would um, huddle with indiscriminately with another vole. And, and that, because uh, if, all it, if, if it's huddling for thermal regulation, then it shouldn't matter which vole it chooses to huddle with. And I think the fact that you find preferences um, would suggest that it isn't just about thermal regulation. Um, although it is possible that there's a need for thermal regulation. And then in addition to that, if you're going to thermal regulate, then you'd rather thermal regulate, i.e. huddle with another, with you know, a particular other individual, and then you would see preferences. But I think mm -hmm. that just the fact that you don't have <clears throat> 
um, that I'm sorry, the fact that you do have these preferences would tend to argue um, against it being primarily about thermoregulation. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a question that I'd love to answer that's, that's sort of that question, like why do they show this preference? And, and one possibility is that it's sort of, that's the side effect of as you relax that territoriality and social fear or aggression or all of those things that keep you from being social as you relax them, they're easier to relax towards individuals one at a time or, you know, and, and there may be some factor that, you know, thermoregulation might drive that need to be in a group, but there are other things constraining the group. Another hypothesis is just that, uh, and, and I have no broad evidence for this, but I would be really interested to, to figure it out, is maybe voles as a group, perhaps because of their, you know, some monogamous ancestor or, you know, something that laid the groundwork for social monogamy and voles, are more inclined to preference behavior because of these sort of evolutionary relationships. And that when they start to be social, their social behavior looks familiarity biased. Right. So some of the voles are just never going to be social. Metavoles are not the only ones with one of these seasonal transitions. So taiga voles or yellow cheek voles also undergo a seasonal transition. But in that species, it's the males that go from being very territorial in the summer to everyone lives in groups in the winter and they live up north in Alaska. And they're extremely cute and easy to handle. I would love to work with taiga voles more. But um, that that, you know, maybe they would also show partner preferences in their social behavior because they're voles and because that's sort of the origin of, you know, maybe that's sort of deep in the origin of social behavior in voles. And I don't think anybody's known that partly because uh, all the species that get tested in voles that aren't monogamous. So there's Taiwan voles seem to show signs of social monogamy, prairie voles, pine voles, um, but the other species tend to be used as outgroups. So they're tested, for example, whenever meadow voles are tested, they're tested in their less social long day, day length. So if you see a comparative study of prairie voles and meadow voles, prairie voles show constellation behavior, meadow voles don't show constellation behavior. They've always tested the meadow voles in long day lengths when you would expect them not to be particularly social. Um, so I, I don't know the answer to this, but I'd be really interested to, to kind of get at that same thing you're asking, which is why the selectivity, if the goal is just to be in a group? I don't know, and I think it's really interesting. You know, I, I did a study um, some years ago that I never got around to publishing. I'm still hoping to write it up now that I'm retired and it always seems to be on the back burner and never happens. But uh, it, it's sort of different, but I think it's relevant to what you're talking about. This was with prairie voles. And I had, um, this was in a large um, behavior observation room. So the voles had lots of space to run around and do whatever they wanted to. And I was comparing two different groups. One, um, which I call the, the kin groups. Um, I had 10 groups of three males who were all brothers and three females who were all sisters, but they were not brother and sister. So the females were related to one another and the males were related to one another independently. Um, and I left them in the observation rooms for uh, three weeks. The, the other groups were the non-kin groups. And this was where all individuals, all males and all females, were started out as strangers to each other. Nobody was genetically related. And the figure that you showed of the voles all, you know, um, sort of forcing themselves into this little tube really reminded me of what I saw because I had um, small um, cages as places that they could go. And I had enough cages for each individual vole to go to an individual cage. And what I found was that in the kin groups, um, I would come in and, and I was doing regular checks like every few days. And what I found was in the kin groups, all six individuals would be jammed together into these little cages, you know. Um, and, and I mean, they had some space, but it really was. I mean, they really were jammed together in contact with each other. Um, while in the non-kin groups, 
I never found more than two individuals, typically a male and a female, in one <clears> cage. <throat> Um, so they really spaced themselves out, except for, you know, the, the, the pairs, the, the ones that form pair bonds and you would find them together. But I never, ever, not once did I see all the individuals are actually more than two individuals in a single cage in the Nankin group. That's um, fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Because it also, I think, matches a lot of what you're saying. Um, and again, you know, this was Prairie Voles and everybody was maintained at the same temperature. So I don't think that thermal regulation was an aspect of it. Everybody had the same, um, you know, light cycle. And so the groups were totally equivalent except for their relatedness. Mm -hmm. And you saw these enormous differences in, um, in huddling and, and spending time together in contact. So I just wanted to throw that out. Yeah, that's so, so fascinating. I, it makes me think about a lot of different things. So one of the things we did early on with the Meadowvoles was test to see if it mattered to them, if the partner we gave them was kin or non-kin, and it didn't um, uh, for the Meadowvoles. And it makes me wonder, I'm actually going to share a slide uh, if I can, let's see if I can share screen again, um, because I, this is a slide I didn't share before. Uh, I showed you the data from the RFID tracking from our pilots in the Meadowvoles, but our very first round, these social networks actually come from uh, an experiment we did. I, I used this um, RFID tracking arena in a research course that I was teaching, and the students got to come up with what question they wanted to address with it, and uh, they wanted to stick a whole bunch of prairie voles, male and female, into the apparatus and see how their social networks developed, so they were all unfamiliar to each other. So the top figure there, um, you can see there's three males and uh, five females, and the top figure is on day one uh, in the apparatus, um, how much time they spent. So the, the thickness of the line is how much time that particular pair spent in contact. And then that's at the end of 10 days, I think, um, at the bottom figure. So you can see that some of the voles really didn't hang out with, with any of the other voles, um, or actually one of them escaped. So that's why its lines are thin. Um, but the, the thick lines there, you can see there were actually quite a lot of huddling relationships. Well, this is chamber sharing, but but it went along with huddling, um, which, we, which we got from video footage um, between multiple males and between multiple females or a male with two females or three males and a female. So we got all sorts of interesting constellations of behavior that we didn't expect. So the students expected, oh, they're gonna pair off and each of these pairs is gonna go be in a different chamber of the apparatus. And that's not at all what they did. I don't know, and I, I, I suppose I could look it up. I don't know if these males and females were related. They probably were. It was probably a very, it was very much a convenient sample of, you know, you have access to this many voles. What do you wanna try out in this, in this class while you're sort of learning to use this apparatus and do the data analysis? So. This was also the semester where uh, COVID hit, classes shut down, and we pivoted to being a social network analysis class. <laughs> so, but I would love to, I'd love to see those data if you ever get around to publishing them. Yeah. And, and also, of course, we also did uh, behavioral interaction tests. And in the non-kin groups, you saw much more aggression. I mean, you virtually never saw aggression in the kin related groups. Mm -hmm. And there we were testing um, females with females and males with males. So, you know, it's not surprising because all the males were related to each other, no fighting, all the females were related to each other, no fighting. In the non-kin group, you did see high levels of um, aggression. Mm -hmm. Especially at, well, I shouldn't say this, but on the very first day, because we also had one, a one-way glass so that we could see them without their seeing us. And so nice. the, right after we released them, you, you saw just lots of running around and, you know, um, not so much aggression as avoidance type behavior and running away from each other in the non-kin group. In the kin group, the behavior was very different. Um, but I think what's more telling is what happens over the, the three weeks that they were there. Mm -hmm. 
So. Yeah. Well, and I feel like in some ways we're circling back with our behavioral assessments to, you know, there used to be these large open chambers and people would study lots of animals at once. And then sort of everything went to these prescribed behavioral tests. And now uh, people like me get excited when we can put animals in large chambers again. And, and really it's, it's returning to the roots of, of a lot of this kind of testing. And, you know, now we have RFID tracking and video tracking to make the data analysis part easier, but yeah, I think, I think studying group living animals in a group context is really, uh, really important to do. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Uh, it's already 10 to the hour. We I can... have one more question. Oh, please go. I think I'm up there. Yeah. Let me make, can you hear me? Yes, yep. we can hear you. Yeah, you can. Okay. Um, sometimes uh, I like to try to reduce things to the simplest level. And in terms of uh, selectivity and choosing the most familiar partner, and in terms of what selection would favor, it's just quite simply the most energetically efficient way to go about your quote unquote choice. And that would be the more likely response to be favored by selection. I mean, it's just energetically efficient to do that. So are you referring to sort of why they live in groups in general? Well, I'm just thinking of um, the simplest possible explanation of why there would be this differential preference. It's more, if you have learned something about one and not learned something about another, then it's just more energetically efficient to choose the one that you know better. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what makes it so surprising to me that familiarity preferences aren't the norm in social behavior. So I, I don't know, as a tentatively social organism myself, of course I have familiarity preferences. And of course I go stand right next to the individual that I know over the individual that I don't know. But that doesn't seem to be the case for, I mean, I don't know how to explain then why so few animals prefer a familiar over a novel other individual. Cause, cause I agree with you. It seems to me like that would be the more common behavior but it seems to be relatively rare um, at least in rodents, to have these preferences for familiar individuals. Oh, one other thing I wanted to say in response to, to Zulima, your comment was that we didn't find day lengths. Somebody, somebody asked, uh, Nancy asked about uh, whether your studies were under long days or short days. And we've tested the prairie voles in long days and short days and not found any differences in laboratory behavior. And that's not to say that there aren't any differences in group size in the field, because I know that there are some field differences in, in group composition in prairie voles, but day length alone doesn't seem to be a major driver of social behavior um, in the lab. So I just wanted to tack that on too. I think that we can, it's a few of us, I don't know when Lauren's gonna stop the streaming, but I would like to suggest that we once again, thank Annalise for a wonderful presentation and an exciting and engaging question and answer session. And now let you go. I know that I understood that you have some, some things coming up and then you, I know you're meeting with some of our uh, colleagues. So thank you so much for the presentation and addressing so many different questions from so many people. Thank you all. And we look forward to seeing you again next Tuesday uh, when we'll hear from Andrew C. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for all your questions. These are really fun to think about and, and what a great group to be invited to. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye, Bye, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Annalise. Bye -bye. It was incredible. I'll see everybody in three to four weeks. Bye.